the founder of Dream Baby Sleep. With me tonight is Jennifer Mandillo on the Dream Team, also a certified infant and toddler sleep expert. Couple housekeeping items. Welcome to the Upper Ridgewood Tennis Club. It's beautiful, we're thrilled to be here. The restroom, if you guys don't know, is right through those glass doors. And what else do you need to know? You're welcome to get up at any point. Just don't trip over the cables in the front. So you <coughs> need to go that way just so you don't um, trip there. You're welcome to get up, get anything you need to drink, eat, use the restroom. This is your time. And I thank you so much for joining me because I know your time is valuable. Okay. So with that said, welcome to Sleep 101. Welcome. Before we start, I want to know really quickly how old your littles are. So you, many of you have more than one. So let's fly around the room. We're going to start with Jen because she's used to this. And we'll start with, you got to fire it out. How many you have? Five, three and a half, 15 months. Perfect. We don't have baby yet. January. January. January what? 29. Oh, I love the newbies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you! I have a 16 month old and a 3 year old. Awesome. 3 year old. A 5 month old and an almost 3 year old. Oh, I love 3. Yeah. 3 year old and 9 months. 3 months. 3 months. Oh, that's Baby. a good age. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm following you. 3 year old and 6 months. Same. 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 Just checking. <laughs> just, just, just checking. <laughs> almost 3 year old and 9 months. Almost 3. 9 and a half weeks. Newly two. I love the half. <laughs> the half. The half. The half. Aaron. Three and a half and two. Two and three. The four-year-olds and two sixteen-month-olds. Two sixteen-month-olds. Oh, 16 <laughs> Ooh, I was hoping for a twin mommy. <laughs> three and nine months. Um, two and a half years and eight months. Same. You are sure? <laughs> Just checking. Sometimes. Also the same. Uh, two and eight months. Awesome. Six weeks. Yes, mommy, daddy, are you sure? Yep. Same? <laughs> Perfect. Six weeks. Six weeks. Oh, so many littles. Three months. Three months. Just checking. <laughs> I'm stepping over you, Jules. Two and six months. Two and six months. Time flies. Seven and four. Seven and four. You are early customers. I know. <laughs> and supporters, which I value. Six, four, and two. Oh, that's a lot. And five, three, and 11 months. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so we have a big mix. Soon to be tiny, tiny littles, and it goes down. So the great news is, is that sleep can be improved in your household at any point, whether you have not had your baby. Well, I can't help you until the baby's out, so I don't, I don't do prenatal. But whether you have a brand new baby, whether or not you have a four, five, six-year-old, Sleep can be improved in your home. Sleep training does not have to mean cry it out. It absolutely can because I support choice. If cry it out is not for you, that's okay. There are plenty of other methods that work just as well. But it's such a myth that sleep training equals cry it out. It's almost like, People tell me all the time not to say this. Don't say it, Carolyn. It's almost like asking somebody if they vaccinate their child, right? What happens? Would you ever have that conversation amongst friends? Do you vaccinate your child? Is your child vaccinated? You wouldn't because it's controversial. When we talk about sleep and sleep training, it, there, there comes a bit of controversy with that. And I'm on a quest to demystify that. Sleep training can mean cry it out, but it does not have to mean cry it out. And Jennifer and I are on a quest to change the term completely. Sleep training. We want to call it sleep education. Because as soon as you say training, people panic, right? <clears throat> Babies should be snuggled. They should be loved. They should be held. They should be rocked. We agree. We agree with that. Okay, so sleep training does not mean that you can't hold, snuggle, love, rock, and bounce your baby to sleep. Sleep training does not mean that you cannot breastfeed. Sleep training does not mean that you cannot feed your baby in the middle of the night, once, even twice. Sure, why not? It depends on the age of your baby and the nutritional needs. So 
First and foremost, we want to kind of demystify sleep training, <coughs> what it is and what it isn't. It's really all about improving sleep in your home based on what you're comfortable with. We factor in three key components when we work with clients. And it is number one, your baby's temperament. Okay, not your parenting style, because your parenting style may not necessarily be aligned with your baby's temperament, which is okay. But we, Jen and I, focus on your baby's temperament, number one. Number two is your cry tolerance. What are you comfortable with? You have to live it and breathe it. People ask us all the time, can you come into my home? Can you just do it for me? What, Jen had a client last week who was like, well, we want to fly you to Nashville. Can you come and do an in-home at our house? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can, but ultimately, we're going to leave and you have to do it yourself. <laughs> like, we're not moving in with you. We're going to come and stay for two or three days. Wishful thinking that sleep improves so exponentially in two to three days. It doesn't. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes consistency. Okay? So, what did I leave out? One, two, three. Temperament, parenting style, cry tolerance. Yes cry tolerance. And that's not the big, okay. I say this and I get a lot of grief for this. So a cry tolerance means what you can tolerate, what you can stomach, what you can stand, what you can swallow. Nobody is comfortable listening to their baby cry, right? So if you have a no to no cry tolerance, you fall into four categories. No to no, it's perfectly normal. I was a no to low, almost a no to no, meaning you're like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't wait even a minute. I've got to pick that baby up. That's okay. There's no right or wrong answer for where your cry tolerance is. It just is where you are, which is perfectly fine. So you're a no to no, you're a no to low, you're a low to medium, or you're on round three like Jen over there and you're a medium to high. <laughs> Because you've got one who just jumped off the porch and another one who cl climbed out of his crib and right so we're all at different places there's no right or wrong it just is where you are so don't try to say you know what oh yeah i'm a load of medium we always we get that all the time yeah yeah i'm like really it's, don't lie to me i can't help you if you're lying to me right so be where you are and be comfortable there so you can go forward jen so that welcomes you guys into sleep 101 we're going to talk through um, a couple things. Most of you guys know me. A lot, of, a lot of my local friends are here, which I greatly appreciate everybody supporting myself and Dream Baby Sleep. You're, we're gonna, you're gonna hear a little backstory on me. We're gonna talk about what's going on. Five reasons why your baby is not sleeping. And when I say baby, I really mean baby or toddler, okay? I'm talking about zero to four years old. And just so we know, for our newest, about to be mommies and for our super littles we don't sleep train a baby until 16 weeks from your estimated due date okay so we have clients all the time that want us to take them at eight weeks 12 weeks we don't take clients prior to 16 weeks for a sleep training program we have a newborn program which is amazing but it's not formalized sleep training because a baby um their body doesn't start to produce melatonin, which is the hormone that naturally induces sleep, until 12 weeks. With that said, anytime I say melatonin, I panic. We don't ever supplement melatonin with a child, ever. Unless you have a, a neurologist prescription, you don't ever give a child melatonin. Okay, so with that said, zero to 16 weeks, all bets are off. We're rocking, we're shushing, we're bouncing, we're nursing to sleep, we're holding, we're baby wearing, we're doing our whole thing. We've got that bouncy ball out, right? <laughs> we're doing all of that all day, all night, and our goal is to minimize sleep, to minimize awake time and maximize sleep as much as possible. So when I'm referencing babies and toddlers when I'm speaking tonight, I'm excluding zero to 12 weeks. We're gonna talk about foundations that we can set for zero to 12 weeks, but when we're talking about formal sleep training, sleep education, it's over the age of four months old from your estimated due date. I have two clients right now that lied on their intake forms and <laughs> tried, tried to pretend that their babies were 16 weeks. I'm like, You're, that's not true because you told me two different dates. 
because they want to start so badly because their eyes are literally bleeding. We've all been there, right? You're just like, God, you have, don't turn me away, help me. I'm like, it's okay, we won't turn you away. We're still going to help you. We just have to take a slightly different approach, okay? So uh, what else are we going to talk about? Oh, bedtime routine, that's, that's the holy grail. Tips, tricks, and timing, night waking, the cause. Anybody that follows us knows the cause of night waking. Don't give it away. Nap schedules. Everybody's like, I'm not going to live and die by a schedule. I have a life to live. I can't just be at home with that baby all day. We get it. We know you have multiple children or you have your first and you have a very, very spectacular life <laughs> that takes you all sorts of places. I didn't have that, but a lot of people do have that, which is fantastic. But we can teach you how to create a nap schedule that doesn't make you, you know, trapped in your house. You can take what we call a nap pass. Woo, it's like a party. You can take a nap pass, but we have to get sleep under control first. Okay, so you can't be out free as a bird with your nap schedule until it's under control. We've got to get it under control first, okay? Um, we're going to talk about the most popular sleep training methods, and then we're going to have a Q&A. We're going to answer your questions. Go ahead, Jenny. Thank you. Oh, this is us. Wow, those headshots. Bam. You were pregnant there. I was. That's great. I took that in front of my bush, <laughs> out in front of my house. Alpine Terrace. That's amazing. So our team has doubled since then. We now have Aaron and Stephanie and Kylie, but we're working on updating that. So as far as introductions, Dream Baby Sleep was started when I had my daughter, Christine, who is now almost seven years old. She turned seven this December, and I thought I had a broken baby. A broken baby. She ate. And she pooped, so all that stuff was functioning. But she did not sleep. She didn't sleep, and I was like, I'm doing something wrong. And everybody kept saying, oh, welcome to motherhood. You know, congratulations, this is how it works. You're supposed to be tired, you've done it. And then it got to a point where she was about eight or nine months old, and I was like, wait a minute, something's not right here. And I feel like I should have resources available to me that I don't have similar to how we have lactation, so widely accepted, right? It's covered by insurance, they come to your home, they provide it in the hospital. We don't have that for sleep. Hopefully we will, and we're working hard to get there, but right now we don't have that. So I didn't have that. A friend of mine said to me, hey Carolyn, I met with this sleep consultant and my baby now sleeps through the night. I was like, sold, sign me up. I didn't check her credentials, I didn't look at her website. I called her and I said, Please help me, you worked with my friend Gina. And that was it, we were off to the races. I was so fascinated by what occurred that it became almost an obsession of mine. I was like, how do people not know about this? How did my pediatrician not say anything? How did my OB not say anything? Why is this, not, why do people not share this in hospitals, right? Nobody's talking about this. So it turned out that the person who helped me sleep train, sleep educate, myself and Christine, was the founder of the school that I ended up going to. So I, I got really lucky. Since then, we've expanded. We have Jennifer, we have Zan, we have Erin, we now have Stephanie, and we now have Kylie. And we're supporting families all over the US, and we love what we do. Our goal is to simply help improve sleep in your home based on what you're comfortable with and what your goals are. It's that simple. It's different for everybody. You can go forward, it, Jenny. Thank you. Oh, that's me. We talk a lot about that. I broke every rule in the book. That's funny. It's funny, but it's true. So I legitimately broke every rule in the book. And people ask me, what does that mean? What that means is I nursed my baby to sleep. Naughty. Not naughty, but people say that, right? I nursed my baby to sleep. I held her to sleep. I rocked her to sleep. And I co-slept with Christine until she was 11 months old. 11 months old. So when I say I broke every rule in the book, I just was living, surviving, trying to get my baby to sleep. And I was exhausted. And I didn't know any other way. And I wish that somebody at that time told me that there was a different way because I was beside myself, I could not function. 
and I was kind of at my breaking point, which is where all of this evolved and why we are so passionate about helping families sleep. Go for it. That headshot's atrocious. <laughs> Seriously, who doesn't update this stuff? It's terrible. Okay, with that said, let's talk about what's going on. Let's uncover the reasons why. Quick housekeeping note. You guys can screenshot this stuff. Don't be shy. You're welcome to take photos of this at any point, okay? So if something up here moves you and you're like, ooh, I need to know that, like when we get to the nap schedule, feel free to take a photo of it. So what's going on? We're uncovering the reasons why your baby isn't sleeping first. Why are they not sleeping? Yes, mommy, I love a screenshot. Your baby is hungry, legitimately hungry, okay? That's a, that's a primary reason. Your baby is overtired, often overtired. Uh, most people are not underfeeding their babies. There's a few, but most are not. If anything, we're feeding because we don't know what else to do, right? So a third, baby has discomfort. They're gassy, they're teething, they're not feeling well, right? Uh, baby's too excited. Ah, second wind, you're like, come help me. And lastly, and most importantly, your baby does not know how to self-soothe. So self-soothing is a learned behavior. Thanks, Jen. Self-soothing is a learned behavior. It's not an innate skill, okay? You are not born with the ability to know how to sleep. There are certain physiological things that happen in your body to help promote and foster sleep. However, it is a learned behavior. So with that said, your baby needs the tools to learn how to soothe themselves. Because when you have two children, three children, four children, you are not going to be able to immediately run to baby at the drop of a dime because you maybe have a toddler in your kitchen who just broke a glass and there's an older sibling somewhere who's not of age to clean it up and you have like code red on your hands, right? So baby is going to be left safely in their crib for a period of time. Maybe it's two minutes, maybe it's five minutes. They're safe, they're nurtured, they're loved, and they're in their crib and they are left to themselves. That doesn't make you bad, it just makes life, right? So with that said, we're gonna talk a lot about babies that don't know how to self-soothe. Infants, you can go forward, Jen. Infants don't know how to self-soothe, nor should they. Okay, zero to four months, all bets are off. We are rocking, shushing, bouncing, holding, nursing, feeding, whatever, whatever. We can't say car rides anymore. I used to do that. I called it circling the drain. Does anybody circle the drain? You drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. You go to the same Starbucks drive-through, possibly two or three times. Maybe you keep a baseball hat in the front seat because <laughs> you're like, oh, they won't recognize me, right? I used to call it circling the drain. We can't talk about fostering car seat naps because for safety reasons, you don't want a baby sleeping by themselves in your back seat without you being able to see them. Okay, so we all know that. So with that said, um, we want to talk about the foundation needed to improve your sleep routine. This is where the goods happen, okay? It's like building a house on a really, really poor foundation. You can't build a beautiful house and expand on it if you have a poor, cracking, rotten foundation, okay? So with that said, everybody hates it when I say this. All my, who's my toddler moms? Toddlers, yeah, everybody hates this when I say this. Sorry, not sorry, but it's true, it's scientific. Our practice is really built on the science behind sleep. We believe that when you leverage science, you, you can't go wrong, so the light off of an iPhone, an iPad, whatever device you're on, the light sends a signal to the brain to be awake, right? So the reason we don't want electronics 30 to 60 minutes, I mean, I mean 15 minutes. If you can do 15 minutes, you're winning, okay? 30 to 60 minutes, 30 minutes, you're a rock star. 60 minutes, you are a total overachiever, and I applaud you, okay? <laughs> However, the recommendation is 30 to 60 minutes because of the chemical reaction that happens in the brain when the light hits your eye. It tells you, like, wakey, wakey, it's time to wake up. So if you're trying to foster sleep and you have a toddler that is resisting bedtime, you need to age-appropriate bedtime. 
if you forget everything that I that you learned here tonight literally everything don't forget this one thing age-appropriate bedtime is the number one tool in your toolbox and it is the number one problem that everybody has if you have a baby or toddler who is not sleeping well you need yes take a picture of that you know you can stand out don't even worry about that please take photos of it you need an age-appropriate bedtime bedtime for everybody in this room is between 5 30 p.m. at the earliest everybody's like what did she just say <laughs> oh yeah you know it you know it on daylight savings I was like "Woo! it's bedtime she was like well it is dark out I'm like off you go she's 7 6 30 boom see ya okay. so age-appropriate bedtime though is so so important if you do if you change one thing one thing this is where sleep education comes into play. You have to make bedtime earlier. Our children are going to bed way too late, way too late. Zero to four years old, my daughter's seven, she goes to bed at 7.30, and it's not because I'm a, well, maybe it's because I'm a sleep expert. <laughs> it's possible, it's possible. But I mean, the kids are going to bed too late. It's 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. If you're in this room, bedtime applies to you. That is your range. And everybody says, Carolyn, why? Why is it between 5.30 and 7.30? How do I navigate that? I'm overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. It's a range for a reason. We base bedtime off of the quality of all of our day sleep. We base bedtime off of our baby or toddler's temperament in the late afternoon. If they're a hot mess, your baby could possibly tolerate four hours of awake time. Any littles that have older siblings often can tolerate more awake time, naturally. A new baby, no other siblings, may only be able to tolerate three hours of awake time. So people ask me, what are the awake hours supposed to be? What are the awake hours supposed to be? I'm like, I don't know, what are your awake hours? Maybe I, as an adult, could get away with six hours of sleep at night. Maybe you sleep eight, maybe you sleep 10, maybe you sleep seven. We don't work off of awake hours. We use them as a rough guide, but we're not living and dying by awake hours because there is a huge span of what a baby can tolerate. Bedtime is king. We move mountains to protect the king. You must make sure your bedtime is between 5.30 p.m. I have a lot of working clients. Majority of our clients are dual <laughs> households, families working outside of the home. 5.30 is not possible. It's not realistic for your family dynamic. However, I guarantee you, you have at least two days off a week. So when you can control it, you will leverage that early bedtime because that's the key to success. It's the key to success. 7.30 p.m. is the latest. I did it. I commuted into Soho and I did what I call the mommy hustle. I would literally be running down Hudson to get to the PATH train at Christopher so that I could transfer to NJ Transit and get home to put my 18-month-old to bed by 7 p.m. You have to do what you have to do temporarily in order to get sleep under control. I can manipulate a schedule and bump it out so that it works better with your work-life balance. I can't manipulate a schedule that's broken. If you have an overtired, hot mess baby or toddler, you have no choice. You have to take a sacrifice for two to three weeks and bring bedtime down. Let's get it under control and then we can bump it out, okay? White noise and room darkening. Gotta have it. I want your rooms pitch black. If you don't have room darkening shades, you could do what Jen and I do when we go on vacation. What do we do, Jenny, when we're on vacation? Black garbage bags. Black long garbage bags. <laughs> You can see us on vacation. It looks like Dexter lives in whatever house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it literally works. Yeah. It does. Our kid, my kid sleeps in a bathroom, a closet. Yeah. And painter's tape. So oh, use painter's laughing. tape. <laughs> you definitely want to use painter's tape so you don't damage your walls. Hotels, you're fine because they have the blackout, right? If you're renting a house, or you're down at the in-laws, you're at the shore, you're at the beach, you're wherever. You need to have a blackout environment. Again, it goes to the no electronics. The light at whatever time in the morning that you don't want to be up, the time that you don't want to be up, that light hits the baby's eye and it sends a signal to the brain that it's time to be awake. If that's 3 o'clock in the morning and it's just natural moonlight, you, you want to set yourself up for success. So get blackout curtains in your home. 
There are a lot of really affordable solutions. You can get them on Amazon. They're like temporary. Who is that? Easy Blinds? Easy I think we're partnered blind. with them. Yeah. They don't pay me to say that. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. But there's a lot of temporary blind solutions. You can go to Home Depot and they have all sorts of level or and whatnot. They're expensive, but they are very, very affordable solutions. Black out your rooms. Early bedtime, black out your rooms. Continuous white noise for nights and naps. End of story. It's, non, it's a non-starter. And we love the Marpac. And they don't pay us either. They should. Right. Swaddle that baby for all your littles. I can't tell you how many times I hear my baby hates their crib. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't. And crib manufacturers across America will tell you otherwise. They don't hate their cribs. You think they hate their cribs, but they don't. They don't have the cognitive wherewithal to hate anything. Right? They don't hate their cribs, and they sure as heck don't hate a swaddle. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said my baby hates a swaddle, oh, they hate it, they hate the swaddle. Yeah, what? No, please, your baby lived in here for nine months, basically in a permanent swaddle with their little arms and legs all jammed up all over the place. It's a, it's a lifelong swaddle in there. So when your littles come out and they're zero to four months old, you want to swaddle them up. When you're in the hospital, you want to ask your nurse, to, you want to take 10, 15 minutes each day. Daddy, this is super important. Learn how to rock a swaddle. It will be the best thing you ever learned. If you can rock a swaddle and really know how to do it proper and swaddle that baby, they have a, a startle reflex. It's a moral reflex. It, it wakes them up. Their little arms are out of their swaddle, and all of a sudden they're like, eee, like little fish. <laughs> and they startle themselves awake. We, ha we have to foster that for them. We have to help nurture that for them. They must be swaddled. I have a lot of people that are like, my baby's got to have one arm out. Great. Swaddle one arm out. But please make sure you rotate the arms. Otherwise, <laughs> so many people say that to us. Is that not a common thing? Does everybody know that, to rotate the arms? Otherwise, you get a dominant arm. Think about it, right? Yes. Okay, so rotate the arms. You can swaddle one arm in. Hey, Greg. You can swaddle one arm in and one arm out. Just rotate them each sleep cycle, okay? Swaddle the heck out of your babies, zero to four months. Once they start rolling, no more swaddle. We're all about safe sleep. It's really our number one priority. If you have any questions about sleep safety, please email me, call me directly. I welcome those conversations. Safety is our utmost number one priority. You want to make sure that you have nothing in your cribs other than a crib and a sheet. That's it. There's no bumpers. I don't know why they sell them. There's no bumpers. There's no comforters. There's no large stuffed animals. Okay. You want to make sure that you are providing a designated safe sleep space for your baby. Okay? Whether they're sleeping should be your second priority. Their safety should be your first. So those beautiful bumpers that you registered for, I never used them. Never used them once. Because then once you can use them over the age of 12 months, I don't even think the Academy of Pediatrics recommends them. Over 12 months. They do, because we get this question a lot. But I don't recommend them after that point because when they're 12 months, they use the bumper as a, as a stepping stool to jump out. And it's like another safety issue, right? So, you know, sheet only, crib sheet, mattress, fitted, that's it, end of, okay? Put your baby down, drowsy but awake. Everybody's like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What do you mean by that? How do I do that? It goes a little something like this. Oh, you're so cute, I love you. It's night, night time, and you place the baby down. They're not asleep, they're drowsy, they're awake, and then you leave. <laughs> That's it, That's it. Like everybody's like, what, how does it work? What's the formula? I'm like, there is no formula. You just have to put them down, drowsy but awake, and you have to step away. If you're not comfortable with leaving them to self-soothe, i.e. cry, that's what it means. I'm not here to mince words or trick you into thinking it's something that it's not. When babies first start to learn to self-soothe, the only mechanism they have to express themselves is crying. If you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. 
You still put them down drowsy but awake and or wide awake. You back up. The moment they start crying, maybe they don't, and you're like, sweet Mary, this is amazing, and you just run, right? If they start crying immediately and you're not comfortable with a wait, meaning three to five minutes, you go back to them immediately, but you've done your job. You put them down drowsy but awake and turn the corner. You turn right back and you go in, you pick them up, you pat, pat, shush. Okay, self-soothing does not mean you have to sit and leave your baby to cry. Okay, keep going, Jenny. What do we got? Oh, multiple night waking. Oh, yeah. The majority of our clients are battling with multiple night waking. They're up, babies and toddlers, two, three, four, five times a night. They're crying out, mommy, dada, the hangnail, this, that, and the other, right? It's going on and on and on. The excuses are endless. Multiple night waking is often caused by bedtime being too late. It's the number one cause of multiple night waking. Bedtime. Remember one thing tonight. Make your bedtime earlier. Make your bedtime earlier. The number one cause of bedtime battles and multiple night waking is bedtime being too late. 5.30 to 7.30 is your window. If you have an older child, it's on the end of that spectrum. If you have a younger child, it's on the bottom of that spectrum, okay? A chemical reaction occurs in the body when a child goes to bed too late. That's why everybody's like, well, why does my child have to go to bed at a certain time? What does an age-appropriate bedtime mean? If your baby doesn't fall asleep within an age-appropriate time frame, a chemical reaction occurs in the body. Melatonin, which our body naturally produces, is a hormone that helps induce sleep. The melatonin converts to a stimulant which is cortisol, and then it's like your baby or toddler has had a cup of coffee, right? That's where you hear the phrase, oh, look at her, she's slap happy. Oh, wow, she's got her second wind, right? We don't want that when we're trying to foster sleep. You have to get in front of the chemical reaction with an age-appropriate bedtime in order to prevent that second wind, okay? It takes about 60 to 75 minutes for that to burn through your system, which is why you experience about an hour, hour and a half of a bedtime battle, okay? We want to avoid that. Using feeding as a soothing mechanism will teach your baby to wake at night. Sorry, it's true. Okay, so we feed the nutritional need. I'm not against feeding babies at night. I love feeding and nurturing babies all through the night, okay? We feed the nutritional need. Does your baby need three night feeds? Right? You ask your pediatrician. You ask them, what's the weight of my baby? Are they growing on a curve? Okay, how many night feeds does my baby need based on their weight and growth development? You wanna see a curve. Don't so much worry about the percentile. It's zero to 100 for a reason. As long as you're somewhere in there, you're good to go. You wanna see growth on a curve, okay? And milestones being met. Then you wanna determine, and you know, you ask yourself this, how many night feeds does my baby really need? Like, am I feeding her because well, I don't know what else to do? Or am I feeding her because she's been asleep for four or five hours and yeah, she very likely is hungry, okay? You need to focus on the nutritional need and not the want, okay? Yes, thank you, Jen. Napping by age, oh, do I love a nap. Who has nap struggles in here, nap battles? Nap battles, yeah. Short naps, 30 minute naps. Naps, short naps, no naps, none, none. You have a naughty baby. Yes. It's okay, a lot of people do. Short naps, no naps, short, short, okay. Short is super common. So a sleep cycle is usually 20 to 30 minutes, right? 20 to 30 minutes is a sleep cycle. So we need to teach baby to get those sleep cycles to connect. All babies wake up at night. Everybody wakes up at night, adults and babies included, wake between eight to 10 times a night and we don't even realize it. We realize it with our babies because we're like, think on the monitor, stalking the monitor, right? Okay, so I have a lot of monitor addicts who are clients and the first thing we tell them is to move away from the monitor, okay? A little bit, try to a little bit. So zero to four months, we wanna minimize awake time, offering nap every 60 to 90 minutes. When your baby is in this department, in the zero department, your awake time is gonna be 30 to 60 minutes. You wanna be offering nap as much as humanly possible 
prior to four months old. You do not want an overtired baby on your hands. You want to feed, sleep, play, right? We've all heard that before. You do not want, everybody's like, oh, keep your baby up during the day and her sleep better at night. No, it's the opposite, okay? We need to foster sleep during the day in order to maximize the night. Four to, four to nine months old, three naps a day. They're falling roughly at nine, noon, and three, roughly. It swings about 30 minutes each direction, okay? You base your nap start time on the quality of the previous sleep cycle. Nine to 14 months, two naps, right? Everybody in this, this three nap zone doesn't know how lucky they are. And they're like, oh, you know, all my baby does is nap and I wanna get out of the house. And then you get over there and you're like, damn. <laughs> yeah, so enjoy this part, okay? Nine to 14 months is two naps. Two naps that are falling roughly at nine and one. The timing of the science behind sleep is where the magic happens. If you are not roughly within these time frames, that's likely your problem. Okay, your bedtime is too late and the timing of your naps is off. Because we're, we're, we've studied the 24 hour cycle of the REM stages of sleep. And this, I didn't, I wish I made this up, right? A lot of our practice is from Dr. Ferber, Dr. Weissblut. There are a lot of really smart folks that went before me. Timing is critical. It's the key to success, okay? 14 to 19 months old. Oh, one nap. We hear it all the time. Like, oh, the guy's dropping. He's dropping a nap. We're going to one nap. Meanwhile, from three to two, you're like, what am I going to be off this three nap schedule? From two to one, you're like, oh, God, say, say it's not happening, right? Nobody wants to be on the one nap schedule. But the one nap schedule starts between 14 and 19 months old. Babies, toddlers who have older siblings tend to transition earlier. If you're experiencing night waking out of the blue, if you're experiencing early rising, if you're skipping naps occasionally, the two to one nap transition is upon you, okay? Nap for a one nap day is always gonna start between 12 and one. It's never before 12 and it's never later than one. It's so important. I heard that, I heard that. I heard that in the front. I'm going to take that question. I can't wait for it. Okay. So all of my babies that are short napping, you have a, a sleep cycle that's 20 to 30 minutes. So when the baby doesn't know how to self-soothe, when you don't put the baby down drowsy but awake, imagine this. Imagine if you fell asleep with your husband on the couch. I'm speculating that you have a husband. <laughs> if you fell asleep with your husband on the couch and then you woke up alone in your guest room, what would you experience when you woke up? <laughs> you'd be confused and you'd be scared. Confused and scared. That's what happens to a baby when they fall asleep nursing or bottle feeding. Either way, they're falling asleep feeding in your arms and they wake up and they're not in your arms and they're alone and they're in their crib. They're immediately startled. Whoa, this is not the last place I was. I don't recognize this. I didn't sign up for this. Where's that warm, snuggly lady? Right? So they're immediately startled and it's a little bit scary. So that natural sleep cycle that's 20 to 30 minutes that they wake in, we all do, it startles them and now they're like proper awake. And you've got yourself a problem on your hands. Okay? So we have to put them down drowsy but awake. We have to apply the one hour rule to nap one and two. What do I mean by that? The baby stays in their crib for one hour from the time you place them down inside, not here, inside their nap window. All bets are off here, okay? Inside their nap window, if you're on a two nap schedule or a one nap schedule, you have to keep them in their cribs for a minimum of 60 minutes, even if they wake up after 20 minutes. You're like, well, what do I do then? What am I going to do when the baby's in there screaming their head off? We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about the sleep training methods that you can apply. Okay? So on a one nap schedule, we have the 90 minute rule. All right? Go ahead, Jen. Thank you. Oh, this is my favorite one. Hang on. Let me have that train. Hmm. I put it up there. What do we call it? We call it extinction. 
we don't even use the word cry it out. We call it extinction. We support that. I support choice. Jen supports choice. Our entire team supports choice. If you want to use cry it out, absolutely. People believe that sleep training equals cry it out. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that at all, but it absolutely can. Okay, so let's talk about this. I wrote a book about this this summer, and I broke down all these methods. So extinction cry it out is just that. It's the most commonly misused, misapplied sleep training method out there. Everybody thinks and says, well, we did cry it out for two weeks, three weeks, eight days, five days, two minutes, and it didn't work. I'm like, really? That's strange. Because statistically speaking, that's not possible. <laughs> However, cry it out means this. You put your baby down drowsy but awake at an age-appropriate bedtime. You shut the door and you do not return until 6.30 a.m. You do not go to your baby. You do not pick up. You do not wait an hour and a half after crying and then decide to go in and give a feeding. You do not go in. It's extinction. You are letting your baby cry until they fall asleep. If you're comfortable with that, then that is absolutely the right method for you. If you're not comfortable with that and it almost offends you, that's okay. Don't panic. You're not, you still have tons of other methods to work with, okay? So with that said, cry it out is the most direct approach that you can take. And honestly, and interestingly speaking, oftentimes a method is chosen by mom or dad's comfort level mom or dad's preferences, not the baby's temperament. Oftentimes, when you go to your baby and you're applying one of these other sleep training methods, you go to your baby and you go to pick them up and they're like this. They're arching their back and they don't have reflux. They're wincing away from you, right? Your presence is not soothing to them. They're looking at you and they're like, you know what, lady? If you're not here to feed me, then get out. Okay, because I don't need you in here jamming up my whole show. Okay, oftentimes you're resetting what's happening by interfering with it. However, if you're not comfortable with it, don't start here and think, you know what, I'm going to try. I'm gonna, if you in your mind are like, you know what, I'm going to try that. I think I can do it. Not the right method for you. We don't try this. Okay, we know this is where we're starting and we, and we go all in. Okay. We always want to start more gradual and progress if we decide that that's where we are. Fall off that bike. And what's going to happen when they fall off the bike? They're going to cry. Of course they're going to cry. And what are you going to do? You're going to go to them and you're going to say, it's okay. You've got this. Here we go. Pedal harder. Pedal harder. You can do it. I believe in you. It's the same exact concept. Well, when we talk about controlled crying, because that's what check and console is. When we talk about controlled crying, check and console, providing loving direction with a baby, suddenly we're savages. But yet everybody learns how to ride a bike and nobody's a savage. And newsflash, you don't need to know how to ride a bike in order to have appropriate brain development, overall wellness, cognitive function, and a list of other amazing things. It's a luxury, okay? Sleep is not a luxury. So, Check and console is your bike riding method, and it involves crying. If you're like, no way, no how, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing that whole crying thing, it's not for me. That's okay. That is okay. We have so many clients who are using pick up, put down. It's a gradual method. We place our babies down drowsy but awake. You cannot escape that. You can't escape that. Sorry. You have to be drowsy but awake, okay? And or wide awake. I don't know why everybody's so afraid of wide awake. Don't be afraid of it. Place your baby down drowsy but awake. Baby starts crying immediately, and you're just like creeping out of the room. You go back immediately. You're not waiting for an escalated cry. You go to baby, you pick up, pick up out of the crib. You pat, pat, shush, it's okay, it's night, night time, it's time for sleep, you're holding. You don't get to sit in your rocker. We have rules for that. You don't get to sit in your rocking chair because we know what happens there. Wake up two hours later, right? So we don't sit down, right? But we're holding baby, we're patting and shushing until they're calm, not asleep. We hold baby, pick them up until calm, and then we place them right back down. As soon as we're placing them down, 
they're screaming. You're like, oh, mercy. And you pick them right back up. You pat, pat, shush until calm, and you place them right back down. Often we do a hybrid between pick up, put down, and check and console, and implement like a two to three minute wait if mom can wait two minutes. And then we do a pick up. So it really just depends on your comfort level. But pick up, put down is super, super effective for our babies who are four months to 12 months. Over 12 months, not so much. It's too stimulating. The, you know, the blood rush from the heart to the head and all the picking up, it's a lot. With our little peanuts, pick up, put down works really, really well, okay? Chair method is for my toddlers who like to leave their room or jump out of their cribs because they're naughty. No, they're not naughty. They're just living life, right? So chair method is another gradual method. And often people's instinct is to go to chair method because they think it's going to be easy. None of it's easy, sorry. But chair method requires you to sit in the room with your child as they're crying, as they're fussing. And you just look at them. It's not like check and console. You're not touching them. Not with chair method. If you're going to follow the rules, you've got to follow the rules. Check and console, you can touch them, but you don't pick them up. Pick up, put down, no crying, no waiting. Pick them up immediately. Chair method, you're not picking them up, okay? And you're not touching them. You're sitting in the chair. And they're looking at you like this. Mommy! Wow, puppy! Right? You're doing all that kind of stuff. Chair method is a gradual a very gradual <laughs> method because it takes a long period of time. You've basically got to put like blinders on, stare at the floor, and all you do is this. <laughs> You're just shushing them. So for our mommies that are like, you know what, I want to be in the room, I want to be present. This method absolutely works. And I'm by no means making fun of it, but don't be mistaken. It's not easy. Okay, you put yourself in the room with your child who is crying, looking dead at you, <laughs> reaching for you, calling your name if they can speak, and you're just like, oh God, help me. Shh. <laughs> right? So you have to have thick skin to be able to do this, but we have a lot of clients that are like, nope, I want to be in the room. Okay, you could be in the room. What if they just so way what back they there, Aaron. I love a crawl up on me. What do you do? Just shush them? Yeah, so not on here is silent return. So if they're out of their cribs and climbing on you. So chair method we combine with our older toddlers with silent return. So it's a chair method and a silent return. So you have to put like your super zen kind of, <laughs> if you do yoga, mojo on, okay? They're pulling on you, they're climbing on you, they're like, I, got, I need this, I need that. And you just have to not react to any of it. Our toddlers want that reaction, right? They know what buttons to press. So we have to be really, really careful with our toddlers because they are hustling you, okay? If they're out of their cribs or even in their cribs and they're over the age of two and a half, they are very likely hustling you. My favorite was Christine with her hangnails. Mama, 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 in the middle of the night. Mama. I go running in there. What's wrong? Are you okay? I have a hangnail. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't even know what a hangnail is. Right? And then it was Mama, Mama, Tucky. I went on vacation with my sister, and we shared a hotel, which I don't recommend. But my daughter would want her blanket tucked in. Don't use a blanket with a toddler because they can't control it. Don't give toddlers things they can't control. And she would yell all night, Mama Tucky, Mama Tucky, except she didn't have the T. It was an F. <laughs> A full F all night long. It was not Tucky. That wasn't the word she was yelling all night long, and it was quite, quite apropos. So don't give toddlers things that they can't control. They want to be in control. If you give them a blanket, don't do that. They make sleep sacks up to 5T for a reason. Don't go there, otherwise you'll end up with a ma mama tucky type situation, okay? So as far as sleep training methods are concerned, chair method, silent return is amazing for toddlers. 
That's when they're out of the crib and or their jumpers. So safety first, babies don't come with parachutes. If you have a jumper and they're jumping out of their crib, that is a major safety issue. If you don't have your furniture anchored in your baby's rooms, you're out of your mind, okay? There is a significant safety issue with furniture that is not anchored. All of the baby furniture comes with that weird looking button harness thing that goes into the wall with those dowel-y looking things. You need to use those. We have so many clients who have had major, 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 major medical situations with furniture that was not anchored that a child climbed up on. You must anchor your furniture for your toddlers that are out of their cribs because they use everything to climb on and then the whole thing topples over on them and it can be really, really life-threatening. So make sure you anchor your furniture. So with that said, what's the number one tool in your toolbox? I taught you one thing tonight, you're tired. You can't remember. I said, don't forget it. Don't leave here and forget to do this one thing. The one thing that you are going to do tonight. Bedtime. It's bedtime. You've got to make those bedtimes earlier. It's the number one tool in your toolbox. Even if it's 15 minutes, if your bedtime, I know you're in here. I know somebody in here has a 9 p.m. bedtime and they're like, oh, I don't want to say it. You don't have to say it. That's okay. We all start somewhere. If your bedtime's 9 p.m. tonight, tomorrow night it's 8.45. You need to shave 15 minutes off of your bedtime each night until you get to a more age-appropriate bedtime. If you're commuting and you're working outside of the home as well, and you're not able to get home before 7.30, we can work with that and adjust it, but you have to control it when you can. I know you're getting at least one day, hopefully two days a week off. Okay? We've got to make that bedtime significantly earlier. It's the number one cause of multiple night wakings. It's triggered by bedtime being too late. Early rising. Whose toddlers are waking up at the crack? No. Well, daylight savings. That's just the meanest thing. Why do we even have that? So silly. Okay. Early rising. The number one <laughs> trigger for early rising? It's bedtime too late. Okay? Sleep begets sleep. Do not fear the early bedtime. Everybody's like, if I put my baby to bed at 5.30, they're going to be up at 3.30. No, that is not true. They're going to be up at whatever time they're going to be up. But they're certainly not going to be up earlier because you put them to bed earlier. So oftentimes we get a lot of questions about prioritizing sleep. Oh, I, you know, I have two, three children. I can't take all my naps at home. What do I do? Night sleep. This is important. Night sleep is king. So here we're running a, um, what are we, we're a mon are we a monarchy? I use this example all the time and I never get it right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna channel the Duchess. Night sleep is king. We move mountains to protect the king. So if you're on a four nap schedule, five nap schedule, because you have a brand new baby, you're on a three nap schedule because you have a six month old, you're on a two nap schedule because you have a 19 month old, regardless of what nap schedule you're on, we prioritize the bedtime. So if you have to sacrifice something, you sacrifice those naps. Night sleep is king. Based on the science behind <coughs> sleep, the most restorative stages of sleep are at night, okay? So we move mountains to protect the early bedtime. Then, if we have choices and we're maybe traveling, and we're like, we've got to sacrifice a nap. Do we travel in the afternoon? Do we fly in the morning? We're going to Florida, what do we do? Okay, nap one sets the tone for the day. So night sleep is the king. Nap one is the queen. Nap two is the princess. And nap three is, you know, like the Duchess of York. Nobody cares. <laughs> Don't tell the Duchess I said that, because I love her. Fergie. Anyway, so when you're prioritizing sleep, it's the king, queen, princess, and the duchess. Night, nap one, nap two, nap three. Based on where you are in your nap schedule, whether you're three naps or one nap, you're prioritizing accordingly. Okay? So sacrifice in the right place. Go for it, Jen. God, that's a good photo of me. It's not me. Jerk. It's not. Okay, so with that said, I want to take your questions. We have QA. 
You have so many questions. I love that. I love that. I know that there's a couple people that traveled far to get here. If you can't stay for the Q&A and you need to get up, use the restroom and or leave, please don't hesitate. I will not be offended. Um, so if we could have everybody that has questions about, you want to do 0 to 12, yeah. babies and toddlers? Do probably maybe 0 to 18. So you're like a 2 now. Good. And then the smart one. Let's go, if you, just move your seat. If you have a baby who's zero to 18 months old, stay over here. If you have a toddler that's 18 months or older, stay over here. So we can answer more of your questions. Jen and I will split them up for you guys. Who do you want, the babies or the toddlers? Do you, thanks guys. Do you want the babies or the toddlers? Guys and your bad babies? If you have a lot of questions, let's do it, let's hit it. Go, Julia, you're up. Of course, um, yeah. Okay. Do you want to start? Um, you know, I actually am a no, 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 no. It's okay. How old are we now? Six months. Correct. Sleep on the go is junk sleep. So whether we are in a stroller or that's not true. You can sleep on the go is junk sleep, but you can have sleep on the go, but it's only for nap three. So on a, for a six month old, we should be on three naps at roughly nine, noon, and three. Really, eight thirty to nine. That's the window. If he's up early, it's eight thirty. If he sleeps in decently, it's closer to nine. Really, eight forty five is the sweet spot. There's always a sweet spot. Nap one and nap two need to be in the crib. Sorry, I'm sorry. And then nap three, it's tricky with drop off and pick up and all that kind of stuff, but nap three can be on the go. Nap three is always discretionary. It's a short nap. It's designed to bridge the gap between day and night. Okay, so if you catch a nap three, great. If you don't, we're not worried. We're not worried. So you have short naps, I'm guessing. Okay. Yeah, or like he'll wake up at 5.30. Or mm -hmm. 6.15, so okay. I know I already Okay, 6.15, you're in the hunt. You're in the hunt. Sometimes yeah. he'll fall back asleep. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, we so have to cap awake for the day by 7.30 a.m. It's okay. super important. There's no day sleep after 7.30 a.m. And everybody's like, oh, this schedule's so rigid, I don't get it, I don't understand. It's simple. You can't let them sleep after 7.30 a.m. Otherwise, it's gonna jam up your naps, which is then gonna jam up your nights, which is then gonna jam up your early rising, okay? So we let it ride until 7.30 a.m. If he falls back to sleep, amazing, let it ride until 7.30. Gently wake him at 7.30. There's no day sleep after 7.30. I mean, we're waking at the day for 7.30 a.m., okay? And then, if we're sleeping till 7.30, nap one is no later than 9 a.m. Nap one is never, ever, ever later than 9 a.m. It's the timing behind sleep. So the shortest awake period is always gonna be from awake for the day to nap one, because nap one is a continuation of night sleep. Okay. Yeah. You like blink and it's this time for nap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. So we're waking up for the day. We're like, yay! Congratulations! You're awake. Awesome. Yeah. You're gonna feed. You're gonna change. You're gonna, change. You're gonna play for 15 to 20 minutes, and we're gonna be back into nap routine. Okay. And and everybody's like, oh, the schedule is too rigid. Like, it's science. It could go on for an hour. The timing of nap is so 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 important. They it's got to be business. roughly be 9 and 3. Firm. It cannot be later than 9. If it's later than 9, you're screwed. That they're going to yeah. Yeah. That's what they're holding yeah. out yeah. for. Yeah. Yes. So you do this for two hours. The shortest awake so period from awake for the day to nap 1 is that period. Nap 1 is a continuation of night sleep. So don't think of it as like, oh, it's nap time. Just think it's like we're on the night sleep train still. Okay, so that makes sense. Don't focus on awake periods, okay? Because what I can tolerate, it's like how many glasses of wine can I tolerate? How many glasses of wine can you tolerate? Right, we all process things differently. Babies are included. So when everybody's like awake hours or this, this, and this, it's impossible for that to be the same. Whether your baby, both your babies are six months old or not, one is gonna be very different than the other, okay? So nap one cannot be later than 9 a.m. So Even if they wake up at 7.30. I'm trying to do the math of this just from a nursing perspective. So if I wake the baby up at 6.30, you have to be silent. And then you nap by 9, so I'm feeding them earlier, I guess. Um, I actually have a question. So I'm going to feed them earlier than 9. Your question's back down at 9. So she turned 2 in September. Okay. 
kind of yeah. normally I would do three hours between. I guess not. Yeah. Yeah. Way too much. To How old? Okay. Wow. That awake period from awake for the day to nap one is so short. It's not like you're awake. It's like you're hanging out for an hour to an hour and a half before you're returning to sleep. Don't think of it as awake for the day, okay? So if your baby is sleeping till 6, 6.30, 6.30 is good. We sleep train awake for the day at 6.30 a.m. Okay, meaning baby's not coming out of that crib prior to 6.30, otherwise you've got a hot mess on your hands. We sleep train awake for the day just like we do the bedtime. Okay, this whole, my baby's just an early riser, I don't subscribe to that. Okay, it's taught, it's a learned skill. So, if your baby's making it till 6.30, amazing. If not, we're applying one of the four sleep training methods up until 6.30. If it's 6.30, they don't return to sleep, then we're taking baby out. Great job, good try, we'll, do, we'll, we'll try again tomorrow. We take baby out, we nurse, we change, or we change them, then we nurse them and we change them again, you'll find your rhythm, right? So you're feeding as soon as they're waking up? Yes, unless you're doing the three, four a.m. feed, are you doing three, four a.m. feeding? Uh, two. Two, okay. Yeah, so from two to 6.30, that's perfectly appropriate. Yeah, so baby's ready for a full feed at 6.37. Right? So, yeah, so then you're feeding breakfast, and then I would do like a top off nursing before nap time. So, give her to button these nap routines and these bedtime routines up. You gotta button them up. There's like these big, elaborate, like there's an orchestra, the guy who wrote, you know, Llama Llama Nighty Nights in your house. <laughs> You gotta button it up. These routines are out of control. Short and sweet. Nap routine is five to 10 minutes. Five minutes is preferred. Bedtime routine is 15 to 20 minutes after bath. These big, long, elaborate things, it's too much. It's too stimulating for baby. If you're reading to your baby at night, I support that. People are like, you don't support education and literacy. I do. It's really stimulating to babies. A lot of babies, when you're reading them books, when they were just like sitting yeah, yeah, yeah. nowhere and can't even see color yet and you're reading the books there it's super stimulating so you have to look at what you're doing right you want to be nurturing and educating your babies i get it that's great do that during the day take it out of your bedtime routine do a nice like light massage it doesn't have to be bath every night bath or massage pjs bottle breast bed okay if you have a baby that's falling asleep on the breast or the bottle, you need to DM me, okay? We've got to move the breastfeeding or the bottle feeding to the front of the bedtime routine. If baby is falling asleep on the breast, they're going to wake up looking for the breast or the bottle, okay? Bottle or breast, doesn't matter, okay? Breastfed babies can sleep through the night the same as bottle fed babies. It is such a myth. People are like, oh, you're breastfeeding. Of course your baby's up three times a night. Not true. Your baby can't self-soothe. You're putting your baby to bed too late. Your baby is falling asleep on you and not drowsy but awake. That's why your baby's waking up multiple times at night. It has nothing to do with bottle or breast. Okay? So, with that said, did I answer your question? I don't think I did. No, no, you did. You said change it never, like, give a light feeding. Yes. Top or off. It's a top off. Yeah. Because you're waking up and doing a full nursing session. Then you're playing a little bit, kind of. Then you're doing a breakfast solid. So the breast milk or the formula is always the primary source of nutrition. So we always want to offer the solids after that because it's really for play up until age 12 months. It's just tactile play, right? It's not for nutrition. So you want them to be full on the breast milk or the bottle or the formula. And then we do the salad feeding. And then I would give the baby a top off. But don't let that baby fall asleep on your boob. Well, now the problem is I have to drive the toddler to school. And yes. Really yes. Okay, so we do this all the time. So I have a lot of clients in major metro areas like Ridgewood, New York City, you know, just big cities all over the, the U.S. And they have multiple children, they're commuting. You have to teach your baby the transfer. And what I mean the transfer is like, we gotta go. I don't have the luxury of putting you down for your nap at 8.45 magically. For all of my new mommies out there, you can run a solid tight schedule because you only have one. When you have two or three, it gets a little bit different and we have to make different accommodations. So you have to get your older to school. You have to teach the transfer. 
okay? Meaning, baby might fall asleep on the go. As soon as you get home, you pick that baby up out of there. Don't put a baby, don't do what I did. Oh my God. I used to put Christine in her crib, in her car seat. It's like so not safe. It's a train wreck. So unsafe. I also co sleep with Christine, and I have a really strong point of view on this now, but I support choice, so if you want to co sleep and bed chair, that's great, just do it safely, but I would not have done it had I known now what I what I, you know the saying, you know then what I know now. I have a lot of pediatricians and doctors that I work with, and suffocation is a big, it was one of the primary causes of death in infants, and had I known that, I would not have made the choice to co-sleep, and I wish somebody talked to me about it, but if you choose to do, if you choose to co-sleep, you just need to have your mattress on the floor, no headboard, no footboard, um, nightstands, eight inches from the bed, no blankets, no pillows, you're basically sleeping in a giant, yeah, if you want to co-sleep, and when I say co-sleep, I mean bed share, so Kennedy Pediatrics recommends co-sleeping, which means baby's in the same room as you. So um, the Academy of Pediatrics recommends baby in room with you up until six months, at minimum six months, which is great, super healthy, but they're in their designated sleeping space, crib, bassinet, etc. not in your bed. When I say bed sharing, I mean baby's laying in the bed with you, okay? So that's what I'm talking about, mattress on the floor, no headboard, no footboard, eight inches from the bed, okay? Super safe. Um, so with that said, you really, really, really need to make sure that you're leveraging the timing of your naps. The short naps are normal. A sleep cycle is 20 to 30 minutes. So how do you get the sleep? Everybody's like, okay, well, great. It's normal. Now what? Right? How do you get the sleep cycles to stretch? You need to take a step back and help baby connect sleep cycles. So. If he pops awake, you put him down at 8.45, bam, he's asleep in like four minutes. You're like, sweet. You're like, I kind of nurse him to sleep, but not really. Don't tell Carolyn. I'm not sure if that counts. I think he was awake. If you have to ask yourself, he was not awake. And you're a cheater, but that's okay. Okay? If you have to ask yourself, he wasn't awake. He was asleep. Okay? So we want drowsy but awake, meaning baby is aware that he's being placed down. Aware. Not like totally engaged, but somewhat aware. Okay, because otherwise they're going to wake up looking for you. It's the uh, mommy daddy couch scenario, right? So we put baby down drowsy but awake. Baby pops awake 20 to 30 minutes, and you're like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so you wait and you look at your sleep training methods. What are the sleep training methods that are available to me? What am I comfortable with? Maybe I'm going to do a check and consult. Okay, he woke up. It's 9 30. I'm applying the one hour rule to the short nap in order to get it to stretch. So I know that I put him down at 8 45. He's staying in that crib until 9 45, come hell or high water. You sit in that chair. You can go to him, you can pick him up. If you're using pick a put down, you can use check and console, pat, pat, shush. But you have to choose a method and you have to apply it until 9 45, 60 minutes from the time you place him down. So let's say you're using check and console. 9.20 comes along, Boop, he's awake 30 minutes later, you're like, here we go, you wait three minutes outside of the room, okay, he's safe, he's nurtured, he's fed, he's loved, he's not crying because he's alone, afraid, and abandoned, he's crying because he's tired, immediately just leaving. Crying because he's tired. Like, he wants to sleep. Base it upon so you wait three minutes. You, you go to him. You don't pick him up. You pat pat chest. You know it's okay, buddy. It's night night time. It's nap time. It's time for sleep. <laughs> you give him loving direction, <laughs> and you're out of there. And you wait another three minutes, and you rinse and repeat for give or take twenty to thirty minutes until the one hour mark. If baby doesn't fall asleep within that time frame, you take him out. You say good job, buddy. Nice try. We're gonna try again at the next nap. Okay. At initially, it does not work at all. I get this all the time. I did it for two days and nothing happened. Of course, nothing happened. It's new, it's different. Don't start with naps. Everybody's like, wants to dip their toe into the sleep land. We can't do that. We have clients ask all the time, I just want to start with naps. Nights are a hot mess. We got to really write. Sleep is a 24 hour cycle. I can't pretend that it's not all connected. It's all connected. Night sleep consolidates first. Okay, you know, you're like, whoa, I got it like a six hour stretch. And then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, ooh seven hours, that was nice. And then you had like a five hour quick feed right back to sleep in another five hours. And you're like, wow, this is awesome, right? That night sleep is starting to consolidate. That's what happens first. And then nap one consolidates and then nap two. Okay, good question. Yeah, perfect. 
Well, like, because you say 9, 12, and 3, so what time do you So nap one is over, never, ever, ever, any later than 11 a.m. Just like awake for the days, no later than 7.30 a.m. So all, I have a blog. This information is not secret. It's all there for you guys to look at. So look at what's called the short nap blues, and it has the timing of the naps and when you should cap it. So we cap nap one at 11 a.m. So if baby goes down at 8.45, falls asleep immediately at 8.50, pops awake at 9.45, and then you apply check and console for 10 minutes and you're like, holy crap, they're back asleep. And you, it's like 10.30, you're like, now what do I do? You let it ride until 11. Okay. So do that, you can still do a 12, like a 12.30 now? One. Oh, one. Oh, okay. So nap two is always going to start between 11.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. Yeah, based on the quality of the previous sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. It's tricky. You're tired, so your brain's like, what is she talking about? I don't even hear her right now. Is she still talking? Will that lady ever shut up? Right? You're like, I don't know what's happening. Okay? So don't panic. Okay, we have sleep windows because sleep is a moving target. We have to learn how to adjust and adapt because teething's gonna happen, a cold's gonna happen. We're gonna skip a nap because we have to be at Big Brother's baseball game or whatever, right? Life happens. We have to learn how to adjust and adapt and use that sleep window. Okay, so nap one, it's tiny. You can't screw this one up. It's between 8.30 and 9 a.m. 8.30 and 9 a.m., that's it. Don't put them down before 8.30, and don't put them down after 9 a.m. Apply the one-hour rule to nap, nap one, okay? Super clean. Nap, max two hours. Not max two hours, but max 11 a.m. Roughly two hours. I mean, if your baby's sleeping more than that, woo! living. Okay. So, nap two starts, this is where everybody starts to get like freaked out. It starts between 11.30 a.m. at the earliest and 1 p.m. at the latest. And the window is wide because if your baby took a 20 minute nap one and did not return to sleep, you have to use nap two at 11.30. You have to use the front end of the nap two window. Make sense? If your baby took a two hour nap one and you're like living la vida loca, then your nap two is gonna be closer to the end of the window, which is 1 p.m. Make sense? And nap three is just like a crapshoot. Now what about when they test you much later, how long because of their freedom. do you wake up no matter what? No. Mm -hmm. We don't wake up from nap two. We let it ride because nap two is really our anchor nap. Because when they oh, the screen's gone. when they transition off of from three naps to two naps to one nap, the afternoon nap is the only guy left standing. Where are you going to stop? So we really love him and we nurture that. And that's where you could get your babies on the same nap schedule. Oh, I could. I can name that tune in two weeks, girl. You put down the more challenging one. It's the same as twins, right? So there's, unless they're identical, there's always one that's easier or more challenging. So you put the more challenging one down first. It's usually the baby. <laughs> I would be crying too. You're not alone. We've all been. Okay. So this is the thing. We have to get into a different rhythm. Okay. When yes. we need your feed, we are teaching them to wake in pockets to snack. Okay. So we need to, when they wake up, offer a full, full feed. We're awake for the day. We change them. We play. You're doing your tummy time three times a day. Okay. Super important for baby to gain that head and neck control. It's primarily for SIDS prevention, right? But we really want to make sure we're doing that tummy time because it's, it's like you were right going to the gym, right? So that tummy time will really help engage baby and it tires them out. So you really want to leverage your tummy time for that. So make sure you do it after a week for the day. So they wake up for the day, you're going to change them, you're going to feed them, you're going to do some tummy time, you're going to play, do like a little clap hands, the whole thing, and then it's game on. We are back to sleep, not because he's fallen asleep, because you're working your ass off to get him back to sleep, boy or girl.
Boy, yeah, you're working your ass off to get him back. It's not like, oh, geez, he's not ready to sleep, no, so we're not going to have a nap. You wear him if you have a, any kind of baby carrier, anything. Stroller, Mama Roo, rock and play. Whatever gizmo, he doesn't hate it, he just doesn't understand it. There's all sorts of really magical, fun things happening. You can absolutely hold that baby to sleep. You can feed that baby to sleep. I don't care what you do. Stand on your head to get that baby to fall asleep. You want to foster nap as much as humanly possible. Too much awake time during the day for your baby. Well, you're right in like the day and night confusion. So at night, you need blackout shades. Black. Black. Get your black long garbage bags and your painter's tape. I have a night. Yeah. So the night light is for you, not for baby. So in short order, you'll be able to change a giant blowout poop diaper with one arm tied behind your back and a blindfold on. <laughs> okay. So the night light is not ideal, and when we start sleep training at four months, we ask all of our clients to. Did I answer your question? I didn't. Just lie to me. Okay. Okay. DM me. I'll answer your question. Okay. So you need to minimize the light because the light, same thing with the infants, it sends a signal to the brain that it's time to be awake. So if you have a nightlight, make sure it's out of the line of sight, meaning below the crib or behind a dresser or in the hallway. Okay? Yes. The light's for you. It's not for them. They don't care. They can't even see it. Yeah, yeah, toddlers, yeah, too. So, of course, I was named at three months. Yep. So, my mom and his mom are watching the baby. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's amazing. Lucky. But so how do we nap do? I enforce no. the naps when I'm not even there to, like, You send it to me. You're like, look, I paid this chick a lot of money, and she's an expert. So, seriously, you have to, we have to do what she says. And they're like, okay. I mean, I do that a lot with our clients. A lot of our clients have multiple caregivers, whether it's nanny, daycare, grandma, two grandmas, grandpa, whomever, right? You just tell them, look, we've spent a lot of time, money, and resources understanding that sleep is what drives our baby's cognitive development. A sleeping brain is a working brain. Okay? Just like food is nutrition for our bellies and the breast milk or the formula is important for their bodies to grow, sleep is what makes their brains grow. Like, do you not want your grandchild to have a healthy brain? Right? And you talk to them like that and it seems a bit aggressive. And you don't have to by any means be aggressive, but talking to people think that sleep is just like, oh, you know what, some babies sleep, some don't. It's the number one way to prevent childhood obesity. When you're sleeping, your brain is producing a protein that boosts immunity and fights off sickness. It's so important. So you just browbeat them, or you send them to me. Send them to me. Okay. Another preach. You do correct age. Yes. So we always, always, always adjust the age from the estimated due date, not the delivery date. Yep. So regardless of <laughs> correct. Okay. Yep. I figured, but I just wanted to make yep. sure. That's where the whole fourth trimester comes into play. Yeah. So um, when you think about the fact that the baby's body doesn't produce melatonin until 12 weeks from the estimated due date, that's when we talk about sleep maturity and sleep ready. That's not cool. That's not bed sharing. That's different. So that's good. Oh, she'll fall asleep with you. First in session or the bottle feed to the front of the bedtime of the nap routine. Okay? So if you are bath, what are you? If you're bath, books, breastfed, you want to be bath, breast, books, bed. Okay? You have to move it just one step ahead. So don't worry about that crazy rhyme that I just said. but. You want to move your feed to the front of your bedtime routine. So regardless of what you're doing, if you're bathing, doing a story or a song, then feeding, then bed, you want to do the opposite. So you want to move the feed to the front of the bedtime routine. That's where the magic happens. That baby has got to go down drowsy butt awake and or wide awake. 
don't be afraid to put your baby yeah. down a weight. Everybody's yeah. like, oh, what do I do? You put them down and they're like this. Thank you. And you feel like you have to take a next step. You're like, what do I do now? You be like this. See you later. And you need to go. Okay? If they start crying, if they start fussing, you go back to them. Keep in mind, too, with those little ones, babies wake up eight to ten times a night naturally. Oftentimes, when they're awake between four and six minutes, they could be crying out, their eyes could be open. They could even be sitting up if they're toddlers. They're not actually awake. Then you run on in there, because you're there to save the day. And you're like, it's okay, let me see her. And they're like, whoa, and now I'm awake. And you just literally woke them up. So if they're making noise, eyes open, and are crying within four to six minutes of a wake up, they may not actually be awake, awake and you just woke them. Even with eyes open. Even with eyes open. Do you know how many times at night you wake up? that you're aware of. If you did a sleep, yeah, no, you're not aware of it. If you, if you did a sleep apnea study, there's like places you can go to have a sleep study where you go 24 hours overnight and they hook up all the machines to you and they video the whole thing, you would be awake with your eyes open eight to 10 times a night. Right, so you see the baby on the monitor and they're like this. Yeah. Like, did you ever see them with their eyes open in the baby monitor? But they're not moving and they're not looking at anything. And you're like, oh my God, they kind of look possessed. Like, what's going on? What is that? They're asleep. And you run in there and you're like, oh, I should go check on them. And you run in there and you wake them up. Yeah, and they're like, oh, there she is, the lady with the boobs. Hey. <laughs> For me, it's milk time, right? Bottle of breast. It doesn't matter. They're like, there's that chick who feeds me. Yes. So slow, 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 slow. Doesn't mean that just because they're crying and awake doesn't mean they're not actually awake. But from that that stage of like you don't want to do that. Yes. Absolutely. So if you have a partner that you can send in to tag out, absolutely. So I have a night weaning guide on my website. Everything that we talk about, we have so many free resources on our blog, our videos, our website. We have a night weaning guide that will walk you through step by step. You don't have to like night, everybody's like, oh, I'm not ready to night wean. I'm talking about three to five night feeds to two. Baby steps. Over four months, never before four months, really six months. And you always want to check with your pediatrician first. But I was feeding Christine multiple times a night when she was 14 months old. Yeah, here. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, I nursed her until she was 18 months old. Wherever your journey takes you, it is where you are. 